so in the previous module, we've seen that these invariant, A invariant subspaces have a critical role to play in so far as our goal of getting this given matrix to a block diagonal representation goes. So we've seen that in general, if you have your underlying vector space V represented as a direct sum over I of subspaces such as Wi, such that each of these Wi's is A invariant, right? Then we are in for a special property which is that you try and find out a basis for each of these individual Wi's, stack them up together, they will form a basis for V and in terms of that basis now, if you represent your operator A, then it gives a structure such as A11, A22 until AKK, right? Which is the best we can possibly do. Right. So this is our motivation behind searching for A invariant subspaces and we saw that one way of cooking up this A invariant subspace is through the kernels of certain special polynomials, okay? Polynomials when their arguments become matrices, the matrix A to be precise, right? So we've seen that you take any polynomial And you look at something like this, this is not only a subspace but it is also an A invariant subspace, right? Where of course Fx is a polynomial, right? So this then motivates us to look deeper at these polynomials or dig deeper into the theory of polynomials to an extent and that is precisely what we are going to try and do now. But we will do well to remember that we are not studying polynomials in and of themselves without any motivation. This is precisely going to serve as our motivation, all right? So with that in mind, we will now launch into some properties of polynomials and see how these will help us in the long run. So if I give you two polynomials of degree n and I ask you to check if the polynomials are equal, what is going to be your strategy? How are you going to verify whether the polynomials are indeed equal? Comparing the coefficients. Comparing the coefficients. Very good. But now suppose I have not told you what the coefficients are precisely, right? But I have told you some other property. What other property would help you? So for example, if there are two numbers, non-zero numbers, and you want to find out if they're equal, what do you do? Subtract, but that's one way, divide. Yeah, so you divide one number by the other and you see if it leads to unity. So in case of polynomials, it turns out that of course comparing coefficients is one way, but if it so happens that you've been given say F1, which is a polynomial, and let's say F2, which is also a polynomial. And if I give you the condition in addition to this that F1 divides F2, what do I mean by that? Yeah. And F2 divides F1. So when F1 divides F2, it means that this leaves, this division leaves the remainder 0. Hmm? What sort of a division is this? I mean, this is not the division that we do with numbers, right? This is the division of polynomial by another. So just like we write for numbers, we also have similar representation for polynomials. So when we say F1 divides F2, you're trying to write F2x as some quotient polynomial. Yeah, so only admissible variables here, admissible objects here are polynomials. Otherwise, you can do a whole lot of other things. You can write rational functions. That's not admissible, right? So some quotient times 
the divisor plus some remainder and our claim is that this remainder will be identically the 0 polynomial. Yeah, so this is what we call when we were kids we learned this we call this the dividend this is the so called quotient just think about integers and it all goes through in exactly the same manner and this is the divisor this is the remainder. So when I say that f1 divides f2 it essentially means that the remainder must vanish. Now in addition I impose that f2 also divides f1. So what is it? f1x can now also be written as some q prime x times f2x plus some r prime x where of course because of the fact that f2 also divides f1 this must also go to 0 be the 0 polynomial identically. Now if both of these conditions are true can you not conclude that f1 must be equal to f2 if and only if so, yeah what else can be the possibility is it true. So if I if I give you for example x plus 1 and 2x plus 2 do they satisfy this property. So let us call this as f1 let us call this as f2 does f1 divide f2 does f2 divide f1 they are not equal are they of course not. So now in addition if I impose and what else they are monic polynomials right that is very important what do I mean by monic monic means the coefficient of the highest degree of the polynomial is unity right. Now there is no way this this condition is ruled out because this one is not even monic. So when I am talking about two monic polynomials such that one divides the other and the second also divides the first then they cannot help but be equal is it not. So just saying that these two conditions hold does not tell me that the polynomials must be the same but only when I impose this restriction then they are indeed going to be the same right. So that is another test for or another equivalent way of saying so I would not say it is a test because you do not really go about doing this <coughs> while checking for equality of polynomials you actually compare coefficients but this is an equivalent condition that will help us in many of our proofs. So that is the reason why I wanted to introduce this notion of two polynomials being equal if they are both monic if one if they are not monic then you divide it out by the highest degree coefficient and if the highest degree coefficient is 0 then it is not even a polynomial of that given degree. You call something uh, to be a polynomial of degree 5 only if the coefficient of x to the power 5 is non 0 if it is non 0 you can of course divide it out by the non 0 coefficient if it is not unity so that it becomes monic. So you compare them after you turn them into monic polynomials yeah so then this comparison holds okay good. So we will have to remember this as we go along because we will be using this. Now the next thing I am going to claim is that fx is a commutative ring. Of course with identity. So the identity being the constant polynomial 1 <coughs> right. Can you check there is nothing to really prove here where does a commutative ring with identity vary from a field it is not a division ring which means it essentially does not guarantee that every element has a multiplicative inverse. So take for instance x squared plus 2x plus 5. So its multiplicative inverse would be 1 by x squared plus 2x plus 5 
yeah, but this is not a member of this ring. If at any non-constant polynomial will fail to have a multiplicative inverse within that ring. But all other properties you see which are there in the commutative ring, the associativity, the closure, the commutativity, yeah, the existence of a multiplicative identity, the additions and all those properties, the additions and the multiplications and the distributivity, everything else is imbibed in this. The way we understand polynomials and their operations, the additions and multiplications of polynomials, right? So there's absolutely no problem with any of those properties except for the multiplicative inverse. Now, of course, if it's a commutative ring, it is also an integral domain. So remember again, the integral domain does not have necessarily the multiplicative inverse of every element, but what is true of an integral domain is that if you take two non-zeros, then their product will also be non-zero. If the product of two elements is zero, then at least one of them has to be zero. That is exactly the property of polynomial that helps us to solve for roots, right? When we take polynomials, say x plus one into x plus two, then we say that the roots are either minus one or minus two, which means we are equating at least one of them to be zero. So there is also an integral domain, right? So it is a commutative ring with identity. It is also an integral domain, okay? So now for some, perhaps some non-trivial ideas relating to commutative rings. I will see how they reflect on polynomials. So because it is commutative, I mean you understand surely that commutativity has to do with the multiplication operation. It means whether you are multiplying from the left or whether you are multiplying from the right, it makes no difference whatsoever, right? So now, if it was not a commutative ring, then we would have had to define in terms of the left operation or right operation. But because it's commutative, we don't care about it. Instead, we go ahead and define this object called an ideal, okay? So just pay very careful attention. It might seem like a very new notion and it is, but it's nothing fancy. So suppose, A, which is a, sorry, a subset, okay, that is contained inside this, all right, such that for F1 and F2, contained inside A, F1 plus F2, of course this plus is as the addition is defined in the ring, okay. F1 and F2 also belongs to this. So that's the first property and a second property for F contained inside this object, which is a subset of the ring, the commutative ring with identity, and G contained inside the ring itself, F times G belongs to A, okay? Then, a is an ideal of, so I'm writing fx here. You can just replace it with any general commutative ring, okay? It just so happens that fx is a commutative ring with identity as we have claimed. And I ask you to verify that using all the properties that we've gone through many lectures back, right at the beginning of this course. So it'll also serve as a good revision of the ideas. Hmm? So the point is, this is exactly what an ideal is. Do you see a similarity with some other object that you've learned vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, vector spaces or fields? These are almost like 
similar in flavor to what we call a vector space when defined over a field. But when defined over a ring, we do not have that luxury because of that one property that is gone on from that field, right? That field had a multiplicative inverse, a ring does not. So, we cannot really construct a vector space out of it, but at least we can create something like an ideal out of this ring, okay? What is it? You take up, take up any two objects from the ideal, it is closed under addition, yeah? That is the first important property. Second is actually a little more interesting because this is quite straightforward to understand. It is exactly like the vector space. This one says you take any object from the ideal, from the subset and the other object, the second object, you can pick out from the ring in general, not necessarily part of the ideal. But once you multiply them, they should form a part of the ideal, right? So, to give you an example of what an ideal could be, suppose A is defined as fx in a polynomial in the ring such that f of 5 is equal to 0. Can you check that this is an ideal? You take any two objects. So, you take f1 x and f2 x. So, let f1 and f2 belong to this subset. First of all, this is a subset of fx, right? From the definition, okay? Take this. So, we know that f1 vanishes at 5, f2 vanishes at 5. So, what can we say? f1 plus f2 at 5 is what? f1 at 5 plus f2 at 5 is equal to 0 plus 0 is of course equal to 0. Hmm? First property is verified. The second property, let g x belong to the ring, any arbitrary object and f x belong to this ideal. So, this so called ideal, we have not yet checked, right? Then f x into g x evaluated at x is equal to 5. That is what we need to check for membership in the set A. So, this is what? This is equal to f 5 into g 5. Now, I do not really care about what g 5 is because f 5 is already going to vanish anyway. So, this is just multiplication by 0 only leads to 0, right? So, this is an example of an ideal, yeah? Let us give you two more examples. One of course is very similar to this. So, this was example 1 just to get you comfortable with this idea. We will not be going into general ideals. There are left ideals and right ideals. When the ring is not commutative, you have to define them as left ideals and right ideals. We do not care about that because it is commutative ring. Let us take example 2. So, this A is defined as <coughs> Fx such that fx can be written as qx times gx for a fixed gx and fx or rather with fx comma qx, sorry, no, we do not need that, no, fx is already there, with qx is this an ideal? Yeah. In fact, it is a very special ideal. 
this is said to be the ideal generated by G, G and represented as exactly like we did for the span. Yeah, the same notation. All right. Yeah, so this is an entire set that can be characterized by this G. Right. So much so that I might even incorporate a subscript G here. Yeah. Let me do that. Because the G gets fixed. Once the G gets fixed, this entire ideal gets completely defined by that G. Right. You take any two polynomials f1 and f2 such that f1 is q1 g, f2 is q2 g, you add them, it is q1 plus q2 g. Yeah, you take any polynomial f from the ideal which is qx gx and you take any other polynomial say hx. So the product is hx qx gx. So h times q can be called as q tilde so that it is q tilde gx. So again both those properties it is not very hard to check but I leave that to you to just write it up completely. The verification of the fact that this is an ideal and then once you know that this is an ideal I am just defining it to you that this kind of an ideal is a very special ideal it is called the ideal generated by this polynomial gx. Yeah. All right. Let us take a third example such that fx is equal to summation psi i x g i x i going from 1 to k for instance with psi i x belonging to the ring, the commutative ring and g i x being fixed polynomials. What do you think this should be called? By some analogy? It is the ideal generated by the GIs. So this is also nothing but the ideal generated by g1x, g2x until gkx, all right. That is what this is. So you see that we can have an ideal generated by a single element. We also can have an ideal generated by multiple of these. Right? Any questions up until this point about this? Is everything clear? What have we done? We have just defined polynomials. Yeah, not defined really. You understand what polynomials are. We have just told you certain properties that the ring of polynomials is a commutative ring with identity. Then we have just gone on to define this new object called an ideal and we have given you two, three examples to show that we are not talking in out of thin air, that there are ex indeed objects that are significant which come under this class of subsets of the commutative ring that are called ideals, right. And then there is a special name for an ideal of this form which is an ideal generated by the singleton G and this is also an ideal generated by several of those fixed Gs, several fixed polynomials, right. Now we will next define something called, so we understand ideals at this point, all right. So if I assume that we understand ideals, we can take the next leap and say that there is something called a principal ideal, okay. So what is a principal ideal? if an 
ideal is generated by a single element. It is a principal ideal. Okay. So, if you can basically fix up, if you can fix up an ideal by just one element, that means you are specifying an ideal by exactly one element. And if I tell you that one element, you know exactly what all fellows come inside that ideal, right? Then such an ideal is a principal ideal, right? So clearly that example 2 we had was an example of a principal ideal. Just, I am not going to answer it right away. Do you think this one is a principal ideal? Example 3 that we have on the board? It is not? Okay. Okay, we shall see. We shall see. Okay, it is a good point. So, some of you are saying it is not a principal ideal. Okay. But at least you understand the definition of principal ideal the way we have described it, right? Example 2 is a clear cut example of a principal ideal. You, in fact, know that the G is indeed its generator. Next, we have the principal ideal domain or a PID. Okay, this is different from the PID you might have learned in a control theory course. It has got nothing to do with it. So, what is the principal ideal domain? So, pay very careful attention. If every ideal in an integral domain is a principal ideal, then such an integral domain is a PID. Yes? I mean, we take the domain from the integral domain, but we call it a principal ideal domain. So, every ideal in that integral domain has exactly one generator or can, can be represented as being generated by a single element. Then such a integral, such an integral domain is said to be a principal ideal domain. You understand what this essentially implies? If you are living inside such an integral domain where every time I give you an ideal, you can tell me exactly, oh, this I ideal, you know, is generated by this fellow and nothing more or less. It means it is uniquely characterized that entire subset inside that integral domain is entirely characterized by just that one element. Then it is quite straightforward, right? At least you think that it is a desirable quality to be had, right? It simplifies a lot of uh, the successive steps that we want to do with it. What steps? We will come to that maybe much later, perhaps not in this lecture, but at least you do appreciate that living inside a principal integral domain has its advantages. That is the main point. See, these are both nothing but definitions, nothing to prove here. That you agree. This is the definition. Why did I define this? Because I do not want to have to say, you know, a horse is an animal with uh, four limbs. I would rather say a horse is a quadruped. So, I have defined a quadruped and then I am defining a horse. You see? That is the reason we do, we give these definitions, not to make life messy, but to make life simple because we do not want to write long things. Now, imagine if I had not defined a principal ideal, I would have had to write, if every ideal in an integral domain can be generated by a unique element or one element only, then such an integral domain is a PID. That is a lot more words or phrases popped in there. 
right. On the other hand, this I have defined principal ideal. Now, based on my understanding of principal ideal, I already know what this is. So, I am now going to go ahead and define a principal ideal domain. But that is not the most interesting thing. These are just after all definitions. The first non-trivial claim that we are going to make is this. And we will prove it in the next module, but we will state this result. So, you agree that fx apart from being a commutative ring with identity is also an integral domain. So, the claim is that this is a PID or a principal integral domain, principal ideal domain, I am sorry, principal ideal domain. So, fx the integral domain is a principal ideal domain. Okay. That is the claim we shall be proving in the next module. Any questions on this so far? Apart from what the proof is like, we will have to hold on for a moment. But any concept, any concepts that you feel, yes? Hmm. It is not necessarily unique, but you can make it unique up to some, we will see that up to some mechanism, some to some property, some operation we will have to do and then we can make it unique. At least in so far as polynomials are concerned, we can do that. But in and of itself, it is not directly unique and you will immediately understand why because you know multiplications of polynomials by integers or rational numbers or elements in a field do not leave the polynomial invariant, it changes. Hmm? But we will see shortly. So that brings this module to a close.